So welcome to my talk. Um, I'm Bruce Sutherland, and the, my talk is how to get your message out when your government turns off the internet. Uh, this was inspired by the events in the Middle East um, earlier this year and seemed to be continuing, where basically in Egypt, um, the government decided they're not going to completely turn off the internet, but they're going to block the DNS servers, which for all intents and purposes disabled it for the people that wanted to use it. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, been in the information systems field for 20 plus years and uh, designed and implemented networks since ArcNet was, uh, was standard. And I wanted to see a show of hands because I can't really see anything up here. Um, anyway, it was a long time ago, early 80s. And I've been writing code professionally for 15 plus years, everything from Visual Basic to C to Python, Perl, PHP, you name it. Um, been a licensed ham operator for eight plus years, and I uh, really enjoy that. And uh, I prefer Unix type operating systems over Microsoft anything for obvious reasons. So a little bit about ham radio. Um, it's old tech, basically, and typically to, to get the, the distance out of ham radio, you need two pretty skilled operators on either end um, with good setups, um, high power, good receivers, good transmitters, good antennas. And uh, the, the people on either end usually need to know what they're doing um, or else bad things can happen. So this is an example of, um, of a station you would need to, to you know, transmit long distances or communicate over long distances. Um, you need a pretty sensitive uh, transceiver that, you know, this one pictured here costs about $6,000. Um, and it's got all kinds of digital signal processing capabilities to eliminate noise and static and, and things like that. Um, typically, you need uh, good atmospheric conditions to get distance out of this kind of system. But with, with enough power and the right antennas, you can also do it. It also works. But again, you, you kind of need to know what you're doing. Um, the amplifier pictured here, which costs about $4,000, um, will give you a maximum output of 1,500 watts, which is kind of what you need to talk from, say, somewhere, like pretty much halfway around the world, like the Middle East to, say, the middle of the United States. Um, I've, I've heard plenty of conversations, and, and the guys usually say what they're using, and that this is what they're using. Um, this amplifier requires a 220-volt outlet and a high amperage breaker in your panel to be able to get that, that limit. Uh, also, another thing that's very important is the antenna in any radio system. Um, this one pictured is, is a little complicated. It's, that's not really what's required, but something of that magnitude is what you're going to need. And that could cost upwards of $10,000. So, like I said before, you kind of need to know what you're doing with this because you could, uh, if you don't know what you're doing and do something wrong, you could disrupt communications in, of other services, commercial services, things like that, and, uh, and or electrocute yourself, cook your eyeballs, <laughs> which is actually in the ham radio license manual, um, and or annoy your neighbors, at, at the very least. So the equipment we're going to use to do this, this uh, operation consists of a small handheld radio with an output of about 5 watts of power. Um, sounds doesn't sound like a lot, but that's really all we need to do what we're going to do. And a small handheld antenna. Here's a picture of me. Uh, demonstrating the proper, <laughs> proper use of the equipment. So a little bit about obtaining a ham radio license. It's really easy uh, for the technician's license, which is the first one that you have to get. Um, basically, anybody with half a brain can do it. I think most kids in school should be taught to do it. I mean, they're learning the same things anyway. And uh, they, they may as well go ahead and take this. 
it's, like I said, it's very easy to do. Um, for the things we're going to do in this talk, a technician's license is all you need. It, it allows you to, to legally transmit on the frequencies we're going to need to use. And uh, the, uh, the test is basically a 35-question test out of a pool of 400 questions. But the, qu the questions and the answers to the questions are uh, freely available. And they're usually in the back of the study guides that you buy. Um, if you go to, onto Amazon or somewhere like that and just type in ham radio license exam or study guide, you'll, you'll see the appropriate books. Um, and that, that's the recommended method to, to actually learn the material, study from it, things like that. Um, you can memorize the test by going to websites where you can basically, they'll ask you questions over and over and over until you get them right. So you're basically memorizing the test. Um, and they'll present all 400 in that pool to you. So once you get ready to take that, um, you can go to the awrl.org uh, website, and that'll give you times and locations for the test. And I recommend that before you go to take this test, contact the, the location first, because sometimes they'll be listed, but they won't be doing it that, at that time for some reason. Um, so that's a good idea. Now, once you take your test and pass it, the, the paperwork has to be submitted to the FCC because they have to assign you a call sign. And once that is submitted, it takes about two weeks from, from what I remember. Um, and then what they're going to do is they're going to post it up on their website, up on their, their uh, database there. And once it's in there, you can start transmitting. You're, you're good to go. You will get a paper certificate or a license that you need to post in your station and stuff like that, but you don't have to wait for that to come in to start using it. So the technology that we're going to use for this is um, going to be in the VHF band, which is 144 megahertz, between 144 and 148 megahertz. Um, and we're going to use a system called Automatic Packet Reporting System, or APRS. And what it is basically is a digital system that is transported over AX.25 protocol, which is a, it's amateur radio version of X.25 protocol. Runs at about 1,200 baud and is good for the short messages we're going to be sending. Um, APRS only has, I think, three or four different types of packets that can be sent one of which is a beacon, and one of which is a message. And the message is what we're concerned about, because that's what, what we're going to be transmitting our, our message in. Um, the antenna that I showed in the previous slide is not really necessary, but it's, it's a good idea to have that. You'll get more range out of it. Um, you'll be able to, you'll have more time to send your message if you use that kind of antenna. But it's not 100% required. You could use the whip that comes with the, the radio itself. Um, and let's see here. And then the other thing we're going to use is a, an amateur radio satellite to do this job. Reason being because basically when satellites are orbiting, depending on what their altitude is, they have a really large footprint. and the one we're going to primarily be using is the International Space Station, which is a 2,500-mile footprint. So if you're talking about somewhere in the Middle East, there's plenty of countries in, in range, you know, from the hot spot to somewhere that's not in a hot spot. So a little bit about APRS. Uh, it was developed in the late 80s by Bob Bruninga. He works at the... Um, Naval Academy in, in Annapolis, Maryland. It was first developed on an Apple II computer and later on an IBM PC when it came out. And uh, it's designed, this protocol is designed to share your GPS position and ID, which is your call sign, among a large number of local stations. And what, that, what that's good for is if you're running an event like, say, uh, a, f a race, like a marathon or something like that, you would have stations like um, you know, water stations, medical stations, various organizers, all being stations on this network, 
And with the appropriate equipment, you could put all these or plot all these on a map. And as they move around, you would see them moving around on the map. So it's good for, for tracking assets and things like that for an event. Um, So the other thing that's necessary is, is what's called a digipeter, which is basically a repeater station that reads in all the, or listens for all the traffic and then repeats it back out. And that's, these are usually located up on a tower somewhere or on, a, or on a mountain. In our case, it's gonna be a satellite. And that's good for larger events, like for instance, a, um, like a car race where everything is all spread out and you have a lot more stations and, and things like, a lot, a lot more assets to track to see where everything is. Um, another thing we're gonna use is called an eye gate. And what that is, is it's a, it's a link between the radio par part of this network and the internet. Um, APRS doesn't use TCP IP, like I said, it uses AX.25 and the eye gate does the translation between the two, basically. And there happens to be one on the International Space Station, which is good for us. So other necessary infrastructure, Twitter. Um, if you remember back in, in Egypt, everybody was trying to send messages out to Twitter and, and Facebook. And uh, that was, seemed to be the main, the main outlet for, for information coming out of that region to the point where the US government um, asked Twitter to not do service, not perform service on their, on their system, systems so that this information could keep, could keep flowing. Um, so basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna be sending a message from a ham radio to Twitter directly. And of course that requires an eye gate like I just explained in, a, that in another country, obviously a country where you're not being affected or not, your internet's not being shut down. Um, and I'll show you some graphics in, about, you know, over the Middle East where within that 2,500 mile radius or distance, um, there are a lot of countries. If you, if you look at uh, Tripoli in Libya or any, any of the, the uh, cities in Egypt, right across the Mediterranean are a lot of other countries that, you know, or democratic countries basically, and typically this is not gonna happen. And there are a lot of eye gates over there as well. And so when I was preparing this talk, I went looking for APRS to Twitter gateways, and I found two, but neither of them worked. Um, they had websites and everything explaining what to do, but they just, I couldn't get them to work at all. So basically I wrote my own. Um, and that's, you can read about that at hamradiotweets.com. Also, the, um, the Twitter account is Ham Radio Tweets, at Ham Radio Tweets. So here's a graphic showing that the system, the, a basic layout of the system, where you have the handheld radio um, transmitting your message up to the satellite. The satellite then turns around and repeats it back to Earth in that 2,500 mile um, area, and is usually picked up by a an eye gate or digipeter comb combination. And once the eye gate gets it, it goes on onto the internet where my gateway listens out for that message and sends it to Twitter, to, to that account on Twitter. Um, there, were other, there was one other service out there that you had to enter your Twitter information and you could post to your own account, but again, that didn't work and I'm not sure why, there was no explanation. I, I just couldn't get it to work at all. So the setup to send to Twitter, um, on your radio, on your handheld radio, you set the frequency to 145.825 megahertz. Uh, that is the specific frequency that the, uh, the space station uses for their APRS digipeter. Um, in the radio, there is a, a field called digipath, and it's basically like routing information for this protocol. You can have multiple stations in that digipath, but to use the space station, you have to use ARIS as the first one. And so you should enter that in there. To compose your message, basically you, you send the message to TWITR, uh, which is the, the name that my gateway is looking out for on the internet. 
Um, if you wanted to send a, a message to a specific other station, you would enter their call sign in that field. And then, of course, your message. Um, the next thing you do is basically you have to wait, and I'll go into more detail about this in a minute, but you have to wait till the, you and an eye gate are in the satellite's footprint. Once you send your message and the eye gate picks it up, you're good to go. Um, one bad thing is you don't really get any acknowledgement that your message went through or got through, but I'll tell you a technique in a second um, of how to do that. So a good way to do that is when the satellite's coming over, when the satellite comes up over the horizon, basically you send out the, the uh, what's called a beacon, and that's a certain type of packet that I mentioned before that's part of APRS, and that basically just broadcasts your call sign and your position information, your GPS position information. Now, that could be good or bad because, you know, obviously if, if that's being monitored by the government that's shutting down the internet, you don't want them to find you. Um, you don't have to use GPS coordinates for that. You can put your own coordinates in. So, you know, and you can have that be on the other side of the globe if you want, and they'll, they'll just never know. Um, there are, are other ways to be detected, but, you know, that's, that's one way to avoid that. And so basically you send out beacons until you hear the satellite reply or send, that, send your same beacon back to you. That's when you know everything's set up, the satellite's in the right position, it can hear you, you're ready to go, and once you hear that, your, your beacon come back, you send your message out. And that's a good way, that's, I found that works pretty much 100% of the time to get your, your, um, your message sent. So as far as the ham radio satellites you can use, like I mentioned, um, the International Space Station is the best one because it's a stable platform in that it's manned usually all the time. Um, they have a lot of power, endless supply of power up there, and if anything goes wrong and something needs to be rebooted, um, they can do that. There's somebody up there to do that. So th there are other ones that I'll mention <laughs> They're, kind of, they're a little bit unusable at this juncture, but um, PCSAT is an old, older satellite that was created by the Navy, uh, the Navy school in Annapolis. And uh, that's kind of on its last legs. The batteries are shot. It only works in daylight. It doesn't have a lot of power to transmit with. And so you have to have things really set up correctly, have your antenna pointed directly at that thing to get it to work. I've tried it maybe 30 times and only got it to work twice. So it's, it's really not usable, but I figured I'd mention it because basically that's one of the only other satellites up there that, that does this job. Um, there was another one launched by the Chinese called Hope One, but they can't seem to get it working. And that's unfortunate because it's got a, a lot of different radio equipment on it that does different things that are kind of neat, including this function of, of being a digipeter. Um, and like I said, they can't seem to get it working, so basically you can track it and you can listen for it. All it does is it transmits its call sign in, in Morse code. So if you hear that, you found it, but that's about all you can do with it. Uh, there was another one called Arisat that was supposed to be launched early this year, but for some reason it get, got kept getting, getting put on the back burner. And uh, it was supposed to be launched in March. Got struck off the schedule. They, basically what they have to do is go on a spacewalk, hold it outside, and then release it into space. That was set to go in July, I think. July or early August, like August, no, I think it was July, late, late July. And um, I was watching this live, the spacewalk live, when this was going on. And uh, they were all ready to release it, the, the a Russian cosmonaut was standing outside the space station, holding onto the space station with one hand and with the satellite in, its, in his other hand, uh, waiting for the, the word to go, to, to release it. And I noticed something on the screen. There's two antennas sticking out of this thing because it uses two different bands, the VHF and the UHF band. There was no UHF antenna on it, which is bad, bad. Um, you release that thing like that and it basically becomes space junk. You can't use it. So anyway, they realized that at the last minute, thankfully. Pulled it back in, 
and it got released, I think, two days ago. So it's orbiting now and it's supposedly working. I haven't tried to contact it since I've been here, but um, you can also go to AMSAT, um, amsat.org. They have a, a really nice matrix of all the satellites that do different functions, radio functions, amateur radio functions. And um, they tell you which ones are up or down or intermittent. So you can get a good idea of what's up there and what to use or what to try to use. And they usually have, the individual satellites usually have their own website that explains what frequency they're on, how to use them, how to set your digipath, things like that. So satellite pass prediction. This is kind of important because to be effective, you kind of need to have, the satellite has to be in the right place, you need to be ready for it, and things like that. Um, a really good site for this is n2yo.com. It's basically, they, they, have, they provide prediction tables and also a real-time representation of where the given satellite that you're looking for is, and they plot it on a Google map, and then they show you the tracks for, I think, two orbits. So that's really helpful. They also give you, like I said, prediction tables that you can actually have it notify you via SMS or email when this thing's about to come over the horizon. Now, that's of course not gonna help you when the government turns off your internet, but to practice and to get used to this, that's a great tool to use. I use it all the time. Uh, another one is uh, called Satscape. It's a Java-based, locally installed piece of software. And in my opinion, it talks a good game, but it doesn't work real well. I missed many, many satellite passes using that piece of software. So I don't really recommend it, but it's, you know, it's good to try something else out and, and see how it works. Um, another thing you can do is go to the AMSAT website, and there are prediction, past prediction tools on there that you can basically choose your satellite, choose the dates, and it'll give you a printout of 50, the next 50 passes which would be good to take with you into this region that you're going, that you want to send this message from. So, um, also N2YO will give you up to five days of passes. So basically right before you leave, print this out and you, you should be good. Here's an example of a, a prediction table from N2YO. If you look in the columns, you'll see at the very top start, max altitude and end. The start, well, it starts with the date and time, and that's obvious, I mean, you need to know when the date and time is. But the start, they give you an, an azimuth, which is basically a heading, a compass heading. And that's, that's the compass heading that it's gonna come over the horizon on. Um, the, if you look under the max altitude section under elevation, that's the elevation that it's gonna be at its highest point. So basically the first listing there is a, a three degree elevation, that's not a good pass. Very, it's very rare you're, you're gonna be able to use that, unless you're on top of a really tall building or a mountain or near the ocean, if it's coming over the horizon there. Um, a better pass would be that second row, which is a 55 degree pass. And so basically, you, you, you kinda need to have a, an accurate watch or a clock and a compass if, you're, if you wanna be really on, dead on with this thing. If not, you can kinda estimate and do it by ear because you'll be able to hear those packets coming in over the radio. Once you hear it, and the more you do this, the more you get used to it. So you'll know what a good, a good sounding packet sounds like. Um, so once you start hearing that and it starts coming in pretty clearly, which is not hard with, this, with the space station because of the power I mentioned earlier, um, you just start transmitting your beacon. And then once you hear yours, transmit your message and you should be good. So here's another graphic from N2YO. Um, this is, let me go back to the other graphic real quick. If you look at the check boxes there under, see where it says map, um, there's a bunch of check boxes. Basically this graphic is if you check all those boxes and, and map them, this is what you get. And you'll see that, that circle, the footprint of the, of the satellite. Um, I have it centered over Las Vegas right now so you can kind of see what kind of range you'll get. Um, the flat part up at the top of the circle is because of the curvature of the Earth, in case you're wondering. 
Um, but you'll see the range. I mean, you can get up into Canada with this. In fact, I, I'm from Florida, central Florida, and I routinely get packets coming in from Canada, Mexico, at Cuba even, um, from Florida. So some use cases. Um, we'll start with Libya, go to Egypt, and then the USA, uh, Syria and the USA. Um, USA was kind of a, that's an example of, of a USA use case. So the problem with that is in Mexico, there are not a lot of eye gates. I think there's two that I found. Um, and you'll see a graphic later on with another website where you can actually track and locate stations using APRS. And that's actually pretty neat to see, um, especially as in Greece, you know, there's a lot of islands around Greece, and so a lot of ferries going around. All those ferries and watercraft of a certain size are required to use APRS for tracking. So it's kind of neat to see that. But anyway, to go on with the, um, with the United States use case, Mexico, like I found two eye gates there. Your best bet's probably like Vancouver area up in uh, British Columbia there. And that's assuming that the entire United States is off the internet, which I don't know what will have to happen for that to, to take place, but you never know. So here's Libya. Um, the center there is, is over Tripoli, and you can see how many countries, if you look up north, you can see how many countries are covered either partially or entirely by this footprint. And Countries like Spain, France, Turkey, Greece, they all have tons and tons of eye gates. So you have plenty of opportunity to use this kind of system in, from this area. Um, Libya typically doesn't have a lot of population. Most of it's on the coast, I think two, two or three major cities. The rest of it's desert, so there's really nothing there. And, and really, there's nothing down into Africa either. So your best case is, is that northern, the northern Western European countries. So just off the coast of Libya is um, the island of Malta. And there's actually an eye gate on Malta, one eye gate. But north of that is Italy. And there are a ton of eye gates there. Um, another thing you're, you'll see too, you'll notice, if you look on the... Um, the piece of Italy that's protruding from the top there, you'll see a couple of circles, blue circles with WX in them. Those are weather stations. A lot of weather stations are also on the APRS network, um, which is another neat feature. You could, using um, this website, where this graphic is coming from, it's on the bottom there, APRS.fi. This is the website that you use to track all the stations worldwide, anywhere they're APRS. And, APRS stations that get routed onto the internet, you'll see it on this website in real time. Um, so as far as the weather stations go, you can click on those blue circles and get real-time weather anywhere in the world. Um, another neat thing is, too, when the earthquakes were happening in Japan, the Japanese have a lot of earthquake sensors off the coast, for obvious reasons. Those are all APRS-enabled. So you can monitor those to see you know, what kind of um, seismic activity is happening around Japan. And of course, the Japanese are, you know, are very tech savvy. And so you, you're going to have to zoom way into Japan. Otherwise, the number of APRS stations, it just, it just blocks out the entire country. It's crazy. So here's a use case for Egypt. Um, and again, right across, you'll see up north, um, Italy and Turkey, or Greece and Turkey, um, are widely covered. And so there's plenty of opportunity, opportunity to use it from there as well. That black square is the island of Cyprus, which I'll show you in a minute, um, which I think there are a couple of eye gates on that, on that island. So here's that graphic. There are also, there are other, you'll see other icons on there that look like little green stars. Those are other APRS stations that do different things. And using this website, you can basically hover the mouse over any of them and it'll tell you what they are, 
whether they're mobile or static or, or what their deal is. And if you click on them, you'll get their information just in the same format that you're seeing now. So again, this is, um, this is an Egyptian uh, use case. This is Greece you're looking at, and Greece has a lot of different APR stations, both um, sea-based and land-based, that do all kinds of different things. So the system's not foolproof. Um, there are a lot of things that, that can go wrong with it in that there's a lot of components in between that need to be operating for the system to work. Um, a lot of the old school ham guys kind of complain about these newfangled technologies because in their mind, you know, all you need is your station and then somebody else's station you can communicate if you have the right equipment, of course. Um, and they're partially right in that I was able to use, I, one of my first radios was a 100 watt maximum system and using a homemade wire antenna, I was able to talk to someone in the Falkland Islands from Florida. Um, but of course, atmospheric conditions come into that a lot. They have to be perfect. And you know, to be able to get that kind of range, so it's not really reliable. But with this VHF system, if everything's in place, it'll work. Now, this slide basically says you can be detected. What you're looking at is, a, is an American profit signal intelligence platform built into a mine-hardened vehicle. Um, not all governments have this, but, you know, the U.S. supplies a lot of military hardware to other governments, so you never know what you're coming up against. So that's one thing. Um, like I mentioned before, you transmit your position, but you don't have to use your actual GPS coordinates. You can put whatever, put in whatever you want. Um, and the best thing to do is if you think you're going to be detected, after you transmit, move. <laughs> just, just be mobile. And with this radio, I mean, you see how small it is. It basically takes up the palm of your hand. Um, and it's easy to transport. And that antenna I showed you as well, that, that beam antenna, that Yagi antenna, that also breaks down into a, a roll-up bag, basically. So it's very, very portable. So the next thing is you can be jammed. Um, what you're looking at is, a, is an A-10 aircraft with a, an electronic countermeasures pod. Basically what that thing is designed for is if the Air Force wanted to go into an area and, and do operations there and shut down the entire cellular network, which runs in the 900, to 2 point, 900 megahertz to 2.4 gigahertz range, I'm pretty sure, depending on what system you're using. They can send this aircraft up, circle around the area with that ECM pod turned on, and you won't be able to use your cell phone for as long as they don't want you to. And it's not only cell phones. It can be any kind of radio, any kind of wireless. Like if they don't want you to use it, you won't use it because of this device. Um, and again, we're, the US isn't the only country that has this. This is just the most convenient picture I could find. Internet links go down. Um, hopefully, in the countries with the eye gates, there are so many of them that one internet link going down is not going to affect you. Um, and in places like Spain, France, Italy, Greece, and so on, there are many, many, many eye gates. So this typically won't affect you, but it is a possibility. So you can miss the satellite. Your, your pass prediction tables could be wrong. You could print out your pass prediction tables and they could move the satellite. They could re-orbit you know, re the space station if they needed to. And your pass prediction would be off. Typically, the other satellites like Arisat, Hope, the Hope 1 sat, if it was working, um, those can't really be reorbited. They don't. I don't think they have thrusters on them. Um, and so those will, will be pretty standard, pretty steady orbits. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention about the, uh, the ECM pod. One good thing about that system, about using a satellite to do this job, is the satellite orbits pretty much every 90 minutes. 
So unless they want to send a plane up every 90 minutes to jam you, I mean, there are other ways to do that. They can hoist that ECM pod from a balloon and keep it up there for a long time. But it's not forever. That satellite is going to be orbiting forever, basically. Um, another thing to, to consider is the, on the satellites, it's possible to have those digipeters turned off. They can be turned off from the ground. And in fact, the space station, usually when they're not using that equipment, they, they leave it in digipeter mode. But sometimes they make appointments with schools for educational reasons. And they use the same antenna that, that the digipeter uses. So they turn it off at that point. Um, hopefully, it'll be a Twitter type situation where if they know people are trying to use it to get information out, they won't turn it off. And then, of course, Twitter invented the fail whale. Twitter can go down, in case you didn't know that. Um, the gateway that I wrote. Um, is, is it, pretty much I wrote it six days ago in about two hours. So it's pretty quick and dirty implementation. I intend to improve it some, but you know, that, that using the Twitter API, that could also go down as well. And the, the gateway will just never get the message through to Twitter. So. And that's pretty much it. Um, here's some resources um, that I recommend. APRS for, for the information on APRS, um, AMSAT for the satellite information, N2IO for the tracking, Yezu, that's that radio that I use is a, a Yezu handheld radio. I like those very much. Aero antennas, uh, that's that handheld Yagi that breaks down. Those are great. And uh, my email. So if there are any questions. Okay, the question was, how vulnerable is this system to, to interception and, and about the use of encryption? Well, first of all, per, not that this would, would come into effect, but per FCC guidelines, you're not supposed to encrypt any amateur radio traffic. The only thing that's allowed to be encrypted is when you're sending commands to a, an amateur radio satellite. Those can be encrypted legally. Um, so your message can be detected and the message can be seen, but after it gets out, it's out. So, um, I mean, I, I guess you could encode it somehow, but typically these radios don't have that feature. Um, there are other setups that you can use that are not so portable, where you have a receiver transmitter radio and then a computer attached to it that either uses the sound card as a modem. You could theoretically encrypt that. Although you won't find that, that option in any software because it's, it's really not allowed. So you'd have to kind of write your own. Saw another question over here somewhere. I'm sorry, I didn't. Well, that's what I was saying before. There, there's really no acknowledgment that comes back to your radio from Twitter. Um, that, well, there is some, I could build that into the gateway where the gateway acknowledges, you know, messages that were actually posted on Twitter. There is a way to do that. I can have the gateway send a message back. But typically when you're using a satellite, you only have a 20 minute maximum window from when it comes over the horizon to when it drops back below the horizon. And that's on, a, that's on a really good pass, like a 90 degree pass where it's right over, directly over, which is not very often. So, anyone else? Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's classified. <laughs> No, you'd have to be within its range. Say that again. If, if oh, 
Oh, no, that, that won't affect you. Yeah. And because you're, you're transmitting to space, there's a lot of space in there, and a lot of range in there, you know. Um, and I'm not sure what the range of these ECM pods are, but I'm sure they can crank them up or down as they need. Theoretically, if, if the country's small enough, sure. You mean to be able to jam? That's true. That's yeah. That could happen as well. Um, but I, you know, I guess this would have to be a big threat. Like a lot of people would have to be using this for the government to try and, you know, put up a stationary jamming station in their or in their own country. Um, I'm sure the citizens wouldn't like that either. So, anyone else? Uh huh. Sure. Um, I'm not sure the first term you use, but Pico satellites meaning really small. Yeah. Um, in fact, Air, that Aerosat I mentioned is not big. It's about the size of a bread box. It's not big at all. Um, there's not a whole lot of equipment in it. It's mostly batteries. And then every surface is solar panels. So yeah, that's, it's very, I mean, I've seen satellites as small as, you know, like this, that, that do one or two functions. It doesn't cost a lot to launch that. I mean, for the size it does, but, you know. Mm -hmm. So under new jurisdiction that space Well, it's the International Space Station, so I'm sure the U.S. government couldn't dictate what to do and what not to do. I mean, it's, it's funny because when there are American astronauts on board, they change the call sign to ARIS, A-R-I-S-S, and when there's Russians, it's R-S-I-S-S. So um, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know who controls that. I, I know the, the space command, either space command, you know, Russian or American or whoever, and there are other country, countries that send astronauts up there. Um, I'm sure if they all got together and made a decision, they, would, they could shut it off. So, uh-huh. Political discourse meaning to organize a, a like a, a an uprising, for instance. Is that what, is that what you're asking? Um, the question was: Are there any ramifications for using amateur radio to to promote pr political discourse? Correct. Um, there's nothing like that in the rules. Basically, the only rule is they say you can't conduct business over amateur radio. Um, and I'm sure, what's that? Bro Bro broadcasting of, of what? Because radio by default is broadcasting. Oh, no, that's correct. Um, you can't play stuff like music and, and things like that, news. Typically, no, you can't. It's not supposed to be used as a radio station. It's supposed to be used as a communications tool. Um, and, and this use of the satellite is a communications tool, really. So. What about, um, well, the amount of, the question is how much information, what's the maximum amount of information that can be passed over this kind of link? Um, it's not a lot. It's not a lot to use steganography. Like images, that would be hard. Well, I mean, there is part of there is a, a mode in amateur radio called slow scan TV, which is used for sending pictures, 
And some of these newer microsatellites that go up have that capability. Um, so theoretically, you could, you, you could do that, but um, it, it's, not, it's not really designed for that kind of use. So slow scan TV typically is used on, um, if, you're, if you're transmitting terrestrial, where you have two stations and a computer, you know, on both ends, obviously, one to send, one to receive, you could do something like that, sure. And I don't know that anybody would know that you're doing that. So theoretically, you could do that. APRS typically runs at 1,200 baud. Um, I've seen it at 9,600, but that's kind of pushing it. So it's, it's really used for short text messages. So that's, that's the best. Um, the question was, does it use any kind of compression algorithm? No, typically. And maybe it could be construed as, as encryption. Um, if, you, if you compress it with a, a secret key of some kind, then yeah. But typically that's not done because the messages are so, so short and they need to be in, in clear text, so. Uh-huh. Meaning, can you have a digipeter on a drone? Theori theoretically, yeah. Um, I don't know who would do that, because since the, <laughs> the government's kind of the only people that have drones. But yeah, you could do something like that. Or I've seen also digipeters on balloons, high altitude balloons. So sure, you could use that. Now, the problem with that is tracking. It's hard to track a balloon, unless it's transmitting its own beacon with its own GPS position, then you kind of know where it is. But it's, it's harder to track something like that than a satellite. Sure, you could do that. The question was, what about the use of, uh, use of satellite internet providers? And the answer is yes, you could do that. But you could also be jammed as well with the same ECM situation, um, you know, for a limited time, obviously, because those, those satellites are actually stationary. They sit above the equator, typically, and cover, you know, half the globe. They're, they're also higher altitude, so their footprint is a lot bigger. Anyone else? All right, thanks very much.